and largest museum in the Indian subcontinent, the Indian Museum, popularly known as the Jadugar, has over the last two centuries grown enormously in terms of its collections and scope. Each day, it attracts hundreds of visitors, which include both the layperson and the informed viewer from all corners of the country and the globe. The beautiful stone sculptures, the large collection of skeletons continent, rare specimens of the plant kingdom and meteorites from outer space never fail to draw crowds. Visitors to this museum of national importance are left with no doubt that they are in the presence of not only the country's great cultural heritage but also of its immeasurable natural wealth. The history of the origin and growth of the Indian Museum takes us back to the last quarter of the 18th century when the Asiatic Society of Bengal, as it was known then, was founded by Sir William Jones on January 15, 1784. Sir Jones was an outstanding scholar, orientalist, jurist and renowned political thinker who devoted his life to the service of India. The society was to be a learning center for the development of art and culture pertaining to socio-cultural activities, entertaining people, disseminating knowledge and preserving the cultural as well as the natural heritage of mankind for posterity within the geographical limits of Asia. Although Sir William Jones did not expressly refer to the foundation of a museum as a part of the activities of the society, curiosities sent in from time to time by members began to accumulate and in 1796 the members of the society conceived the idea of establishing a museum at a suitable place for the reception and preservation of the objects. Until then the society had no habitation of its own but in 1808 it moved into the building on the corner of Park Street, where it still exists, constructed on land donated by the government. Six years later, a definite effort was made to give effect to the intention to establish a museum. On February 2, 1814, Dr. Nathaniel Wallish, a Danish physician and botanist who had been taken prisoner at the siege of Sirampur, but released in recognition of his scientific attainments wrote a letter to the society. In the letter, he strongly advocated the formation of a museum and offered not only to act as its honorary curator but also to supply duplicates from his own valuable collection to form a nucleus. The proposal was readily accepted by the members of the society. The scope of the museum was also defined in the widest possible terms as an institution for the reception of all articles that might be sent to illustrate oriental manners and history or to elucidate the peculiarities of art and nature in the East. Thus founded, the Asiatic Society Museum thrived rapidly under the guidance of its enthusiastic founder, Dr. Wallish, and individual collectors, among whom may be mentioned Colonel Stewart, Dr. Teitler, General Mackenzie, Mr. Brian Hodson, Captain Dillon, Babu Ramkomal Shen, Begum Samru, Kalikishan Bahadur Maharaja, Radhakanto Deb, Mathuranath Malle, and Shivachandra Das. They readily placed at the disposal of the society interesting and curious objects collected from various parts of the country. After the resignation of Dr. Wallish, paid curators were appointed, some for short periods and others for longer durations at a salary between Rs. 50 and Rs. 200 per month. Among them were Dr. J.T. Pearson of the Bengal Medical Service and distinguished ichthyologists Dr. McClelland and Mr. Edward Blith. In 1856, the members of the society petitioned the government to set up the Imperial Museum to which they were eager to
to hand over their extensive and varied collection. The revolt of 1857 intervened and, although willing, the government declined the project due to financial constraints. In May 1862, the government finally accepted the proposal and an agreement was reached with the Asiatic Society to hand over its valuable collection to the Board of Trustees of the proposed museum. The spectacular building of the Indian Museum with its main quadrangle facing Chorungi Road was designed in the Italianate neoclassical architectural style by Walter Grand, a leading architect of the 19th century who had earlier been involved in designing some of the major landmarks of colonial Calcutta. It was completed in 1877 and its doors were thrown open to the public in 1878 with just two galleries, the Archaeology Gallery and the Bird Gallery of the Zoology section. For over 60 years, the museum was housed at the Asiatic Society as the Asiatic Society Museum. It now became the Imperial Museum. Between December 1883 and March 1884, the first great exhibition was held in the Imperial Museum premises. Subsequently, a block of four floors running along Sutter Street perpendicular to the main quadrangle was built and linked to the main building by two bridges. The construction of the new building started in 1888 and the economic collections, including those of ethnography, were shifted to it in 1891. The building is now with the Botanical Survey of India. A second block of came up in 1894 at right angles to Sutter Street to contain the office, laboratories and storerooms of the Natalist section. Half of the building was on collection to the Geological Survey and now houses the headquarters of the Geological Survey of India. A greater part of the front of the west side of the quadrangle was rebuilt during Lord's time. The oldest building in the precinct of the museum is a bungalow constructed by Peter Speak, a member of the Supreme Council of Warren Hastings. Constructed in 1790, it also served as the Sadar Diwani Court and is now the administrative block of the museum. After independence, the museum was renamed the Indian Museum and obtained the status of a national museum. Till 1960, it was mainly a research-oriented institution. But from 1964 onwards, the greater emphasis has been on the museum itself. The establishment of the museum ultimately resulted in the advent of the surveys. Geological, botanical, zoological and anthropological, which thereafter branched out and gained independent status. The centenary celebrations of the museum in 1914 was a grand occasion and a centenary volume edited by the then superintendent of the museum, Dr. Nelson Annadale, was released. Today, the museum houses one of the richest collections anywhere. The museum's archaeological section is one of the largest in the country and has objects of great beauty and antiquity from the Harappan age to the early 20th century. The ancient Indian carvings at the main Chorungi Road entrance marks the elevated position held by Indian sculpture in the hierarchy of Indian art. The sculptured pieces of timeless beauty in the collection of the museum include the freestanding Rampurva Lion capital of Emperor Ashoka and is a hallmark of Mauryan art. The Kalpadruma or wish-fulfilling tree of the Indian tradition probably belongs to the Sunga period of 2nd century BC. The two colossal pot-bellied beach-jeweled male figures of the Yakshas 
carved from reddish gray sandstone and the Besnagar Yakshi with her undeniable physicality, charm and vivacity share space with sublime figures of divinity. The numismatic collection too is a treasure trove with specimens ranging from the 5th century BC to the mid 20th century when the decimal system was introduced. The art section boasts of one of the best Pahari collections with masterpieces by Ustad Mansoor and Baswan and has a rich collection of the Bengal school. The anthropological section has played an important role in the development of ethnography studies in India. It possesses Shorindra Mohan Tagore's collection of Indian and Japanese musical instruments. The section has a rich collection from the Pacific Islands, Burma and the northeastern regions of India. Wood carvings, metal craft, costumes and arms are some of the important collections. The gallery displaying human evolution incorporates latest information on DNA studies related to human migration. The geology section has an impressive collection of invertebrate fossil, rocks and minerals and a newly opened gem section. The zoology section has galleries dedicated to fish, amphibia and reptiles, birds, mammals and ecology. The botany section has displays on Indian timbers, food products, medicinal produce, vegetable fibers, oil and oil seeds, dyes and tans, gums and raisins, and economic products. Apart from the main sections, auxiliary units have been started which include a publication section, temporary exhibitions, popular lectures, mobile exhibitions in audiovisual vans, and lectures by eminent scholars on specific aspects of the museum's activities. After decades, the main building facing Chorungi Road has undergone complete restoration. The galleries have been rearranged to make them more viewer-friendly. Seven galleries have already been renovated and the modernization of several other galleries will be completed during the year. The objects in the archaeological section have been arranged chronologically and in a manner that would make them easily accessible to the lay viewer. The objects all have new labels. LED lighting and an updated security system have been installed. The bicentenary celebrations will continue all through the year. New publications, outreach programs, seminars and workshops will ensure that the Indian Museum is in sync with modern day realities. The Indian Museum with its huge collection of priceless objects has the potential of becoming one of the world's leading museums. It is hoped that the renovations and upgradations made by Centenary Year of the 21st century institution.